Revelation, please, in chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to read verse 4, and then I'm going to read uh, from verse 9 to the end of the chapter. So Revelation 7 verse 4 says this, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 9, After this I beheld in lower great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. Our theme this morning is going to be the end time awakening, a great awakening uh, in the tribulation period. Amazing to think of this, that in this darkest period of human history, that a great multitude are going to be saved, that nobody can number them. And so, of course, we recognize that uh, in wrath, uh, God does indeed remember mercy. And in this time of wrath upon the earth, uh, there will be evidence of divine mercy, wonderful evidence of divine mercy. And we're going to see that in this uh, section today. We also want to remind ourselves that clearly this is not describing a church age happening. And the reason we've stressed that is that we, clearly we have the Jew-Gentile distinction, which that middle wall of partition was broken down uh, in the church age uh, through the work of Christ. And of course, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free, uh, <clears throat> and uh, male or female in the church, the body of Christ. We're all one. But what we see here in this chapter, is that those distinctions are once again seen. There's 144,000, and they're clearly representing uh, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So that Jew-Gentile distinction is once again in play. We also mentioned last week, and we just kind of quick review, that uh, this chapter um, is is really not part of the main flow of events. It's really just answering a question uh, that was raised in 617. Uh, the great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? And in answering that question, uh, there's this interlude, if you want to put it that way, or parenthesis. And in this parenthesis, it goes backwards before the tribulation begins, because uh, as it were, the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, a, a storm is about to blow on the earth, but they're being held back until the sealed servants of God uh, are, are receive their seal. And so it goes back to before the tribulation, and it goes right the way through to the end of the tribulation, because we're going to see this great multitude who are going to survive the tribulation period and enter into the millennial kingdom. So it's a parenthetical passage. We talked about the seal last time, that it was a mark of ownership and a mark of security. And we want to now consider something, and that is a question. How were these 144,000 saved? Uh, these uh, 144,000, many believe, Jewish evangelists, uh, the, the true witnesses uh, of the last days. 
Uh, how were they saved? And there's a lot of thoughts about this. Uh, was it because of the ministry of the two witnesses? We haven't seen them yet, but we are going to see them in chapter 11. And we're going to see when we get to chapter 11, it's very clear that their ministry took place in the first half of the tribulation period. So were they saved as a result of the preaching of the two witnesses in Revelation 11? That's one possibility. But it would seem that actually these 144,000 were saved prior to the beginning of the tribulation. And again, we saw that by the fact that we're told uh, that these uh, angels are going to hold back the storm winds from blowing on the earth until uh, after the servants of God are sealed. And we see that in verse um, three saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And so it almost seems that some point after the rapture and before the beginning of the tribulation, 144,000 Jewish evangelists are saved, saved and sealed. And so how did this take place? Again, I'm just going to give you some suggestions. We can't be dogmatic about this. Uh, another thought, maybe that it wasn't through the ministry of the two witnesses. Another thought is that the possibility that these are converted uh, in the same manner of Saul of Tarsus. Remember his dramatic conversion uh, on the road to Damascus and uh, how it was uh, quite a remarkable event. And the reason why this thought is if you look at 1 Corinthians, just for a second, and chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, very uh, wonderful chapter on the resurrection. But in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, Paul says, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. And it's often thought that this idea of born out of due time was a reference uh, back to the 12, that he wasn't part of the, the original 12. Uh, he's not part of that group uh, because he wasn't there uh, when the Lord's ministry began. And so that's the general explanation. But another thought that I, to me has a, perhaps more significance is that he's he is a prototype, if you like, of the 144,000. Uh, so it's not a reference back to the 12, but looking forward to the 144,000 witnesses. Now, I just want you to imagine just for a moment, at least allow your sanctified imagination to get carried away with this thought. Can you imagine how much effective ministry could be done with 144,000 people <laughs> who ministered like the Apostle Paul. You certainly would see a great multitude that nobody could number as a result of that ministry. So that's another th thought. What we do know about them is that they're clearly saved individuals. They're people who are going to witness for the Lord and in this very dark time in human history. And we also know that they're first fruits. In other words, God saving these means that there will be more. How do we know the first fruits? Look at Revelation 14, just for a moment, where we encounter the 144,000 again. And we notice it says in verse 4, giving us a little bit more detail about them. These are they which have, were not defiled with women. Okay, so again, they're they're not distracted in any way. Uh, they're, they're, and remember Paul saying again uh, that he wished that they were like he was. <laughs> uh, he, it seems like he wasn't married. He was single, devoted to the work. Uh, so it says they're not defiled with women. They're virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb with us wherever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So if we understand anything about first fruits, it's always the guarantee of a greater harvest. That's the essential meaning of it. When God does something in first fruits, he's going to do something much bigger. And so this 144,000 is the first fruits of what God is going to do amongst the Jews. He's going to save this 144,000 before the tribulation begins, but before the tribulation ends, uh, there's going to be a great harvest of Jews that will be saved. Look at Revelation 11. 
sorry, Romans chapter 11. I apologize there. Romans chapter 11. Uh, we're going to see uh, that there's, there's coming a day when actually all the Jews that, that survived the tribulation are going to be converted. Romans 11, verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And so these 144,000 are the first fruits of what God is going to do and amongst the Jews. He's going to save them, but then uh, towards the end of the tribulation, when, they, they, when they're surrounded by enemies and they look upon him whom they've pierced, a nation, the whole nation will be born again in one day. And again, we, we've looked at that before in Zechariah chapter 12, when it talks about them being surrounded by armies and uh, how they look upon him whom they've pierced and mourn for him. And then that fountain being opened for sin and for uncleanness. And so we do believe that this group is the first fruits and the full harvest will be uh, the salvation of the nation at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Like Saul of Tarsus, these people were saved, they were sealed, and they're sent as witnesses throughout the world. Now, again, we think back to the original Great Commission. The Lord commissioned 12 men whom he sent out. Now, he is going to commission 12,000 men from 12 tribes, so 144,000. And what will be their job be? Again, we want to suggest to you that their job will be preaching what's known as the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, we said there's a lot of parallels with Matthew 24. And I want you to go back to Matthew 24, please, just for a moment. And verse 14, this is what they're going to be doing. It says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Again. Matthew 24, definitely a tribulation text. And so these 144,000 will have this special privilege of preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, what is that gospel of the kingdom? Well, we want to say this. It's telling the world, get prepared. The king is coming. And how do they get prepared? How do you prepare for the coming of the king? Well, just like in the days of John the baptizer, who was preparing people uh, for the first advent, uh, it's a message of repentance. But also, because Christ has already come, it's a message of repentance and faith in Christ. There was the same message that we responded to uh, is going to be preached. But this time, the, the, the difference being that it's not... Uh, looking back to his first advent, but looking to the fact that he's coming to reign as king. And so they're going to preach this gospel uh, and they're going to be effective in doing so. So what is their identity? Well, we said that uh, God is once again taking up his dealings with Israel. They had been set aside during the church age uh, because of their rejection. And God is dealing was dealing with the church. And if any Jew got saved, he became part of the church, the one body. But as a national entity, they were set apart. Uh, but now, now they're once again back in center stage in God's dealings. He's taken up his dealings with Israel, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And again, we, we can't spiritualize this. Uh, much error has been brought about by spiritualizing this. For instance, the Jehovah's false witnesses, they believe that uh, the, those that knock on the most doors will be the 144,000. Well, again, let's just read the text and see what it says. And it's clearly speaking of national ethnic Israel, because it says in verse five, of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asa, verse 6, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of uh, Nephthali, or Nephthali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Sinium were 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin was sealed 
12,000. Now, again, what stands out to us when we read that is two tribes that are normally listed, and this came up a little bit in the Q&A session last week, two tribes that are normally listed, Dan and Ephraim, are missing, and they're replaced. And so they're replaced uh, by Levi, who normally are not listed with the tribes, uh, they're a separate entity, and then also uh, by Joseph. Joseph rep, uh, re, um, takes the place of Ephraim in verse 8 of the tribe of Zebulun was sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Joseph was sealed 12,000. So why Ephraim missing? Why Dan missing? And we said that the problem with these two tribes is that they, in Israel's rebellion, were the leaders in idolatry. And we go back to a book we studied not too long ago, the book of Judges, to witness this. And so I want us to just look just for a moment at the book of Judges and a couple of scriptures, uh, all connected to the same incident. But uh, Judges 17 and verse 1, we find this character. There was a man of Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah. <laughs> and so we have Micah, and remember, he's the one uh, that stole from his mother, and then, of course, from that he made an idol, and, of course, that idol became uh, connected with the tribe of Dan, Judges 18 and verse 30. It says, And the children of Dan set up the graven image and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And so uh, Micah made the idol, and the tribe of Dan set it up and worshipped it. And, of course, that went on till the very days of the captivity. And so the idea is that these pioneered idolatry in Israel, and because of that, uh, they're not... Uh, allowed to represent Messiah in this effort to preach the gospel of the kingdom. However, uh, we will see when you get to the book of Ezekiel and the reestablishing of the tribes in the land, both these two tribes, once again, will have their allotment in the millennial kingdom. But at least for now, they're absent in this section. Now, we're going to leave the 144,000 there for now because we're going to visit them again in chapter 14. But now we want to see this saved Gentile multitude, although I believe that it would include uh, Jews as well. Uh, but notice this, he says, lifted this I beheld in law a great multitude which no one could number of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palms in their hands. And so there's a kind of a stark contrast now between the two groups. You have the sealed ones, there's 144,000. You have the saved ones, this great multitude, no one can number. So 144,000, nobody can number this other group. The first group, 12 tribes. The second group, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples. Uh, the first group, they're sealed before going into the tribulation. The second group we're going to see coming out of the tribulation. Notice verse 14 of chapter 7. I said to them, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation. So one group going into tribulation, sealed before it begins. Uh, they're going to be the, the testimony throughout that that seven-year period, the second group coming out of it at the end of the tribulation period. So we might say this, it, it is a an often uh, accepted and valid inference that the second company is the harvest as a result of the worldwide preaching of the first company. It's what we call a cause and effect situation in view. God sets aside 144,000 as a result of their testimony, this great multitude are saved. And we notice that the message has reached all parts of the earth, all nations. Notice it says this again, verse 9, a great multitude, multitude nobody can number of all nations. In other words, from every nation on earth, there will be a representative in this group, all kindreds 
every family. <laughs> That's amazing, right? There'll be somebody from every family in this group uh, and people and tongues. Uh, every language group, every dialect will be represented. People's good idea of every cultural background. We talk a lot about diversity <laughs> in our culture, but let me tell you something. First of all, there's nothing more diverse than the church of God. <laughs> the church of God is diverse. It's wonderful. You visit assemblies. There's one in Washington, D.C. that I often go to, and it's like being in the United Nations. I mean, there's almost every nation represented there. And by the way, they have the most amazing uh, what we call providence dinners, you could imagine, because you get food from all over the world. But but it's amazing. This is the, the the diversity in the church of God and in the tribulation period. Again, in God's plan of salvation, there's going to be this multitude saved from every background. And we say, well, what about homosexuals? Well, of course, First Corinthians six, uh, it says, and such were some of you, but you were washed. You were. so even people from every perverse background every kind of sinful background a part of god's saving work uh just, just don't continue in their sin they're they used to be like that but now they're part of this diverse uh, wonderful group uh, and so we might say this if we saw the hundred and forty four thousand as the first fruits and of course the full harvest is the um the nation of Israel. But again, I want to go back to Romans 11. Could this be the fullness of the Gentiles that are being brought in? Because in Romans 11, we looked at verse 26, it says, and so all Israel shall be saved. And of course, we know that that's going to be right at the end of the tribulation when it seems like all hope has gone for Israel. Um, and they're going to look on him whom they pierce. But look at the first uh, verse before that, verse 25. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so could it be that this, this great end-time harvest, this great end-time awakening, that reaches through the 144,000 evangelists, people from every tribe and people and nation and tongue. Could it be that that's the fullness of the Gentiles coming in? And then after that, you get uh, all Israel. So all Israel shall be saved. You get the, the ingathering of the nation of Israel in the very end times. By the way, this description uh, that we have here in verse 9 about this multitude from nations, kindreds, peoples, tongues, it's used uh, frequently in this book. Now, we want to just look at the references. Chapter 5, verse 9, they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof, for thou hast was slain, hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. Uh, we see it again in chapter 11. And verse 9, where it says, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies. That's the two witnesses. Uh, three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves. In other words, worldwide, everybody's going to see this uh, event of the, the killing of the two witnesses. But again, that, that same designation, chapter 14 and verse 6 I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And then the final reference is 17, Revelation 17, verse 15. It says, he says to me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And so, again, just this idea of this description used frequently throughout the book. In other words, the whole world is going to be affected by these events in the tribulation period. The whole world is going to touch the entire globe. No place will be immune from it. On the one hand, there'll be people saved from every uh, part of the world. On the other hand... There'll be people who will witness the death of the two witnesses and will rejoice of every people, group, and nation. There'll be people uh, caught up with the beast and his kingdom from all of these nations. In other words, this is not isolated to one area, but the events we're looking at 
are going to have a universal scope. So in answer to the question, now back in our chapter, chapter seven, in answer to the question that was given in chapter six, verse 17, who shall be able to stand? There'll be those who survive this seven year tribulation period. 144,000 are going to survive it. But I want to suggest to you that this great multitude that we see in verse 9 are also going to be tribulation survivors. They're, they're going to, just like the Holocaust, there were those that survived the Holocaust and lived to tell the story. There will be those who will survive the tribulation and enter in to the millennial kingdom. And again, just going to go back to Matthew 24, just to say this, that there are going to be those that are going to come through it all. 24 verse 13, uh, very familiar scripture. It says, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And of course, uh, it's not saying uh, salvation is by endurance, but it's talking about the tribulation period. The ones that can endure to the end, they will be saved. There will, there will be people in their physical bodies who have survived the tribulation period, who will go in to inherit the millennial kingdom. That's a, that's a necessity. Uh, if, if there's going to be this thousand-year reign, you have to have people that go into it. So there's got to be people that survive this period. So when we, when we look at this section of chapter 7 from verse 9 onwards, often commentators make two conclusions about this passage. They say, firstly, it's a company of martyrs, and secondly, they insist that the scene is a heavenly scene. Even so, going so far as to call this section the heavenly bliss of the martyred saints. In answer to this, we might say this. First of all, the passage makes no mention whatsoever of martyrdom nor hints at it in any way, okay? So again, it's the idea of reading into the passage that these are martyrs that have suddenly appeared in heaven uh, as a result of their death. There's no hint of that whatsoever. There's no mention of resurrection in this passage either, again, which would be necessary after martyrdom, uh, especially because it doesn't talk about their souls. And so no hints of that in any way. And so also the idea of palm branches. Notice it says again in verse nine, it says they stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now, palms are often symbolic of victory, but they're also connected very much with the millennial kingdom. Palm branches uh, certainly have a, a direct reference to the millennial days. And so let's just look at a couple of references. The Gospel of John in chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 12 and 13. This is the triumphal entry where they thought the Lord Jesus was going to come and, as it were, sweep away the Romans and enter into his kingdom glory. And so it says, on the next day, much people that will come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And so this idea, again, it was that they expected the kingdom. And part of that is palm trees. It's, it's a symbol of victory that would be connected with the millennial kingdom. Why do we say that? Again, go back to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 23, and the Feast of Jehovah. And the one feast that is representative of the millennial bliss, the, the most joyful festival of all, uh, when uh, the... Uh, God's dealings are, are brought to a climax. We notice in Leviticus 23, verse 34, it says, uh, speak to the children of Israel, saying, in the 15th day of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. And then notice down in verse 40, 
It says, and you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And so certainly palm trees uh, and the waving of palms is definitely has a millennial connection. Now, I'm going to make a suggestion here. I don't want to be dogmatic about it, but this is my own uh, understanding of this that these that are saved are going to be the group in Matthew 25. I want you to look at Matthew's gospel, chapter 25. And we're going to begin in verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me at me, I was thirsty, you gave me drink, I was a stranger, you took me in, so on and so forth. And of course, uh, they said, verse 38, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked? Well, and of course, verse 40, the king shall answer them, saying to them, Fairly I say to you, and as much you have done it to one of these, the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. And of course, his brethren, of course, is the Jewish nation, and I think particularly the 144,000 their response to the 144,000, how they've responded to them is going to have a bearing on them entering into the kingdom, showing their faith, showing that they've believed the gospel. They're caring for these Jewish servants of God. And so this is what is in view. The sheep of Matthew 25, verse 31 through 41, that will go in, that he'll say, enter into the kingdom prepared for you from before the world was. And notice we did see uh, in that very passage that Christ will be seated on the throne of his glory. And it says it says it very clearly, verse 31, where the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And now, what is that throne of his glory that Christ is going to sit on? Uh, of course, we know at his birth, he's going to sit on the throne of his father, David. Uh, he's going to reign over the nation of Israel. But the book of Jeremiah, I want to just look there for a moment. And chapter 3. Remember we said the best way of interpreting this is compare scripture with scripture, especially Old Testament. A lot of the things that are allusions. Uh, Jeremiah 3 verse 17, it says, At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. So Jerusalem shall be the throne of the Lord. Christ sitting on the, th seated on the throne of his glory. And so I want to suggest to you that in this passage, we have a vast company of people coming out of the tribulation, having survived it in their natural bodies tribulation survivors so notice verse 10 says and cried with a loud voice back in chapter 7 saying salvation to our god which sits upon the throne and unto the lamb salvation again refers to the deliverance that he has given them coming through the tribulation period those that have endured to the end are saved and uh, they're saved, of course, they're saved initially by trusting in the lamb and his shed blood, but they've been preserved and they've come through the tribulation. They're the fruit of this gospel preaching. And so we get kind of a little glimpse um, into the heavenly scene as they 
see this event taking place on earth this great multitude all the angels stood around about the throne about the elders the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped god saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our god forever and ever amen why would they say that well if if now the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that repents how do you think they will respond when this great multitude are saved from every tribe and people and kindred and nation, you think there'll be, there'll be a bit of celebration going on in heaven. <laughs> Do you think they might be uh, falling down before their throne and saying blessing and glory and, 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 and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power be, and, and might be to God forever and ever. Amen. And the answer, of course, uh, it's, it's a tremendous outpouring of, of praise in heaven because of what the Lord has done on earth through the 144,000 and this great multitude that have been saved and have come through and are now going to inherit the kingdom. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? Who are, who are these people? Where did they come from? And, of course, it tells us a little bit about their attire. They're in white robes. And so we might say this. We've already seen Matthew 25, this judgment of the living nations, the Son of Man sitting upon the throne of his glory, um, responded and cared for, for his brethren, the Jewish evangelists in the previous section who brought the gospel to them. And now they're attired. They're arrayed in white robes. And, of course, what are these white robes? Well, it tells us, verse 14, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And so, again, it talks about their standing before God, right? They've washed their robes. They made them white uh, in the blood of the Lamb. They're saved individuals. Uh, again, suggesting their perfect acceptability, uh, the saints of God through the work of Christ. They're waving these palm branches, as we've already seen, joyfully acclaiming their king who has gotten them the victory over their enemies. And so it says in verse 15, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Okay. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any eat so further to the previous observations in the millennium they'll call jerusalem the throne of the lord all nations shall be gathered to it the name of the to the name of the lord in jerusalem they'll serve him that word serve him uh, in in his temple day and night serve him day and night in his temple that word serve is usually signifies worship it's the the word from which we get liturgy uh, and, and so it's, it signifies worship. And again, I want to just look back and see uh, this scene uh, predicted in the Old Testament. Let's go back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 2. And verses 2 through 5. Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 5. May we read these words. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people should go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. He will walk in his, and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears to pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Another passage, Isaiah 56. Isaiah chapter 56 and verses 5 through 7. It says, even unto them 
will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than the sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and take hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And of course, Ezekiel 40 through 44 references this millennial temple where the Lord will be served, where people will, he will dwell amongst the people. Of course, the very last verse of Ezekiel is the Lord is there, uh, Jehovah Shammah. And so this is the, the scene that's in view, that's envisaged here. And verse 16 and 17, I think, really kind of uh, show uh, that this is clearly an earthly scene. In contrast to what they have been through, they now receive comfort. And so notice it says, um, they shall hunger no more. There's going to be a divine supply. Uh, they didn't receive the mark of the beast. Remember, nobody could buy or sell unless they had the mark of the beast, Revelation 13, verse 17. And so during that time, no doubt, these people experience great hunger. But now it says they're not going to hunger anymore. Now, of course, if they're in heaven, <laughs> that's a redundant statement, right? It doesn't, it, it doesn't, of course, in heaven, nobody's going to be hungry in heaven. But this is, again, uh, has in view an earthly scene. They've been, th they've been through difficulties. Now they're being comforted, a divine supply. It says, neither shall they thirst anymore. And again, have they been thirsty? Well, we're going to see in the next section that during the tribulation, a third of all fresh water is going to be poisoned. So already the, the water supplies of the earth, many are concerned about having enough water. Well, a third of it's going to be taken out of the way. And then further on in the tribulation period, some of it's going to be turned to blood. And so these people would have experienced thirst. Uh, again, Revelation 16 uh, let's let's just look at this Revelation 16 and verse four. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Verse six: For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. Thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And so again, tremendous scenes of suffering, but now contrasted by the fact that they're going to be comforted tremendously. Hunger no more, neither shall they thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Again, they've suffered scorching heat during the tribulation. Uh, verse 9 of Revelation 16. Men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which have power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. So again, no longer the scorching heat that they have experienced in the tribulation time. And then they're going to have a divine shepherd. Notice this. For the lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them. Again, that word feed means shepherd them. And what's he going to do? He will lead them to living fountains of waters. Now we're going to see in the, in the millennial, out of the temple, there's going to be fountain of living water that's going to come out and it's going to heal the land. A divine sympathy as well, a divine shepherd, a divine sympathy. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And so this is this is the scene that's before us. Much more fitting, I believe, to a to an earthly scene than to a heavenly scene that is going to be the blessing of those great multitude that come out of great tribulation. And so we now come to chapter 8, and we come to the opening of the seventh seal. And so we want to just pay attention to this, and I'm going to kind of give a little bit of an outline of chapter 8. We won't, we won't get very far, 
in the few minutes that are left, but at least we can lay out the outline. In chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, there's silence in heaven. And then verses 3 through 5, there's service at the altar. There's incense being put uh, on the altar. And then verse 6 through 13, there's storms on the earth. Silence in heaven, service at the altar, storms on the earth. And so it's good to remind ourselves as we look at chapter 8 that the Son of Man has been rejected. As a result of his rejection by the earth dwellers, we will not have this man to reign over us. The events that follow are really troubles of their own making because they have rejected the Prince of Peace, because they have rejected the one who loved them and gave himself for him. There are consequences uh, that they will be seen in this chapter. So it begins with this. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, if you remember that before the throne of God, uh, the, the living creatures have been proclaiming uh, day and night the holiness of God. And so uh, heaven is not a quiet place, right? There's, there's constant procla proclamation uh, of, of his greatness. And, and we, we witnessed that. Uh, when we looked uh, at the scene in chapters four and chapter five. But now it says there's silence in heaven and it's about the space of half an hour. The opening of the seventh seal causes this silence. It's connected with the opening of this seventh seal. Now the document, this title deed to planet earth is finally opened and can be fully read. And no doubt, this silence has several thoughts behind it. One is just the wonder of it. Now the lamb is going to take his uh, title deed and he is going to reign. Uh, this is going to happen, the certainty of it. We've, we've now got the identity of the one who has been given the title deed to planet Earth, and all is for his benefit. Also, we have a, a, this, you've heard this expression before, the calm before the storm. And certainly this 30-minute silence is a calm before the storm. Because up to now, we've been looking primarily at the beginning of sorrows, what we consider to be the first half of the tribulation period. But now we're about to enter into this period that the Lord in Matthew 24 and verse 21 describes in this way. Matthew 24, verse 21, which I believe is reference to this second half of the tribulation, then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. What's called the tribulation, the great one. And again, I, I can't emphasize this enough, the words of the Lord Jesus here. There's never been a time like this. Now, if you look at Earth's history, there has been some terrible times on planet Earth, but none of them compare. Now, we think of Nazi Germany, we think of the Holocaust, we think of how horrendous it must have been like to live through that. We think of Pol Pot and his reign of terror uh, in Cambodia. We think of uh, the terrible times during stalin's purges and all of these things and and history is replete with terrible times in human history but the lord says this time there's nothing to compare with it at all never been a time like this unparalleled in world history and so this is the calm before the storm I, i'd like us just to uh, look at this idea of silence before god i think it's it's an interesting thing. Some suggest that it's a kind of a sila. Think about this. I want us to just look at an Old Testament prophet, minor prophet, Zephaniah, just for a moment. Zephaniah and chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 7. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God for the day of the Lord is at hand for the lord hath prepared a sacrifice 
suffice. He hath bid his guests. Look at the same chapter, verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble a distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities, against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So it, it begins with, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It talks about the sounding of a trumpet. It talks about the perilous conditions that will come on the earth. And so this is what we have in view. Uh, this tremendous uh, calm before the storm. Of course, the storm <clears throat> will be announced by the blowing of the trumpets. Remember, by the way, uh, out of these the seventh seal, there's silence in heaven, about the space of half an hour. Verse 2, I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So what we're saying is this, that when we look at these tribulation judgments, the seventh seal, what is the seventh seal? When it's opened, the silence in heaven, and then seven angels are given seven trumpets to blow. Each of those seven trumpets will result in judgment on the earth, except when the seventh trumpet blows, out of that is going to come the seven last plagues. So we see a definite progression here. So there's a pause for solemn and silent reflection. Often in the Psalms, you'll see this word, sila, and it has the idea of pause and think about this. Sometimes it's good to pause and think about this, especially when we look at these passages. Pause and think about this. These events that we're describing is not some work of science fiction. This is really going to come upon the earth. Just as all the prophecies concerning their Lord's first advent were fulfilled literally, so these events are going to take place in a very literal way. And so there's silence in heaven. And of course, he's going to go on and he's going to talk about service at the altar and he's going to talk about the prayers of saints. And it's kind of interesting that there's silence and then it talks about the prayers of the saints. And sometimes, we'll just say this in closing, sometimes when we pray, it seems like there's silence in heaven. <laughs> like there's no response. But ultimately, prayer is answered and we're going to see in this chapter, the prayers that have long been prayed, the, the martyrs who have cried out, how long, O Lord, faithful and true, before you judge those that have done this. And then the prayers, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. There's been silence, it seems, but now the silence is about to be broken and the prayers are going to be answered. And God is going to remove the earth dwellers very swiftly in this last three and a half years and he is going to set up a kingdom which will never end. And so we look forward to those uh, glorious days when the Lord Jesus will be vindicated on the earth. That day is coming, and it's coming very soon. May the Lord encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.